care services and meet infrastructure needs. All right, checking in now on the race for Utah Attorney General between incumbent Sean Reyes and Democratic challenger Greg Scordis. Sean Reyes is at 59% and 60% at this point, where Scordis sits at near 36%. He's already conceded tonight. Reyes has been serving as the state's attorney general since 2013, and Scordis is a well-known attorney in the Salt Lake area who's been practicing since 1982. Now, we caught up with Scordis today who pointed out that there hasn't been a Democrat elected to a statewide position in 24 years. While he says running as a Democrat in a Republican state comes with disadvantages, he ran to give Utahns a choice. I've had so many people come up to me and say, thank you for giving us a choice. Thank you for giving us someone to consider. Even if they don't vote for me, they're just, they're just so grateful that, that the two party system is, is, we're at least trying to make it work. Now we did reach out to Ray's campaign for comment, but we're told that he did not have media availability today. Now to the race for the chief executive in Salt Lake County. This is uh, how it is uh, panning out. Jenny Wilson with a, a strong lead over Republican challenger Trent Staggs, she's at 57% of the vote compared to his 40. Now, Staggs originally stating that he jumped into that race following the Olympia Hills controversy. He's also publicly criticized Mayor Wilson's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, saying that she did not do anything outside of a mask mandate and even making the point that he would increase testing if elected. Now, both Wilson and Staggs telling ABC4 News earlier today that they would be campaigning right up until 8 p.m. for every last vote. I felt like I put everything on the table making tough decisions during COVID. Um, I know they were the right decisions. The voters want that change and they want to be able to have somebody that can lower taxes, restrain spending and implement a vision. Again, a very comfortable lead for Wilson tonight. As you may remember, she was elected to the position two years ago in a special election to take over the last two years of uh, Representative Ben McAdams term as County Mayor Staggs has been serving as the mayor of Riverton for the last two years. All right, coming up, we're checking back in on the race for the White House, an update on key battleground states. And there's that live look outside at the state capitol on election night. Many voted for above average warmth. The results are in, and I'm breaking them down in Utah's most accurate forecast. Time now for Utah's most accurate forecast. Weather rate certified nine years in a row. 
All right, let's take a breather from all the election coverage and chat about the weather, shall we? I think we can agree today was beautiful outside. Yes, winning in a landslide and Chief Meteorologist, <laughs> she has the best message of the night, a very popular candidate. I feel, thank you for your votes, friends. <laughs> I needed them. You know, we elected for some above average temperatures and we saw that through a bulk of Utah. We take a look at our Southern Utah University time-lapse video and you see some scattered showers that were out there. Yeah, you're gonna watch those clouds on the move. Some isolated spotty precipitation. We saw it in places like Duchesne, Carbon County, as well as in Iron County. Look at that rainbow that pops up with those light showers just to trace at the Cedar City Airport, but some measurable moisture in a few other spots. At this hour, those showers are dwindling and we're watching those clouds track over to the east. Drying trend settling in as we head into tomorrow. We were unsettled in central eastern and south central Utah. In the north, it was a bit of a different story. Hazy sunshine out there today with the warmth. Gorgeous sunset looking over the spaghetti bowl. Thank you to Chris Williams for emailing that our way. Temperatures were well above average and seasonably warm as we hit 70 in Salt Lake. Bre breaking a record in downtown Salt Lake. 70s and upper 60s for the rest of the Wasatch Front mid 80s in St. George. Right now those numbers dropping into the 40s and 50s, cooling things off and we're starting to see those clouds get out of the area so clearer skies on deck for tonight. As we head into tomorrow, that above average warmth wants to stick around. We're going to see a dry pattern and those numbers in the low 70s yet again along the Wasatch Front. By Thursday, our next storm system makes an appearance in the Pacific Northwest. We we will start to see breezy conditions on Thursday and start to feel the impacts of that storm as we head into Friday and for the weekend. Temperatures in the 60s and 70s for tomorrow. It's going to be beautiful, but way above average. 72 in Moab, 71 in Cedar City, and 81 in St. George. Let's zoom in and you find your city. Those mountain valleys are going to warm to the mid-60s. Places like Park City at 64, 68 in Brigham City, low 70s in Spanish Fork. A little more sunshine in central Utah drying out, low 70s in Green River and Gunnison, Fillmore getting to 72. Down south, we've got a mix of numbers, 60s, 70s, and even some 80s showing up in St. George, 73 near Lake Powell in the Four Corners area in the low 70s. Here's a look at what to expect for the next seven days in Washington County. Those 80s hold on, and then here comes the colder air. Windy conditions arrive first. We will see very blustery conditions, not just in the south, but also in the north. Isolated chance of showers Sunday into Monday with very cold air filtering in. As we look at the Wasatch Front, that precipitation potential is there. We're looking at rain turning to snow, so mixed precip and then snow showers as we head into Sunday. Those daytime highs dropping from the 70s to the 40s to the 30s and those overnight lows just downright frigid in the 20s. A little bit of everything for this first week of November. Glenn, yep, Emily? That is a serious drop in the next few days. Mm -hmm. Oh, enjoy while it lasts. Thank you, Alana. All right, we'll be right back.
All right, we are back now with your local election headquarters, and we are digging into the election results with analysis from former state Senator Scott Hallen, former Utah GOP Chair Thomas Wright. Gentlemen, let's get right into the very top of the ticket, the big race tonight, the race for the White House. Thomas, let's start for you. What are you watching in terms of what is key for a potential Trump victory? Well, you got to look now at Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. I mean, they've called Arizona. Uh, Ohio's been called. It looks like the president's won Florida. So now it comes down to those three states. We know mail-in ballots are coming in, Glenn, and so it's gonna take a couple or three days to figure out what the results are there. Uh, this is gonna be the nail-biter that a lot of us predicted, and uh, I think the president has a lot of momentum, and I'm really optimistic about how this is gonna turn out for him. Okay, on the other side, Scott, uh, you are a Biden supporter. What are you looking at as uh, we come down the stretch? Those three same states, but the exciting thing about this is there's a pathway uh, for victory for Biden, and uh, I predict that he'll win this. Um, I think when you look at those numbers, it's very close and it's something that, uh, it, it might even be a tie, who knows? But I know one thing, we're not gonna know for at least three or four days. Yeah. And uh, lie you're up, that's w exactly oh. what I think you is happening. You know what, no. would, would, wouldn't that just uh, bring 2020 to a perfect end to end in oh. an electoral college tie? Oh. It would be the perfect thing. And we were just over talking. It could end up 269, 269 with some formula that, that we were over yeah. talking about. It, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's get a little bit closer to home. Utah's fourth congressional district. The last numbers we saw, Ben McAdams holding on to a five point uh, lead. Uh, Scott, let's start with you, 51 to 45. Um, what's the key to McAdams holding on to this? Uh, it absolutely has to be those votes from Utah County. De deciding where those votes are coming from, Salt Lake County versus Utah County, is going to be the deciding factor on that. Again, I will say Ben is one of the best campaigners I've ever known, and I promise you he's got his finger right in the middle of that trying to figure out where those votes are coming from. Okay, uh, Thomas, when we first saw Utah County's numbers, you were feeling good about uh, Owens, but then it started to move more into McAdams. So how do you expect this to play out over the next couple of well, days? Well, I'm thrilled that these ads will be off the air. That's number one, can I <laughs> hey, say? On behalf of all you, hey, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think I even I the candidates might uh, agree with uh, you on but that. But anyway, um, no, we expected that this race would go to a congressman, the congressman early. He opened up a big lead, and that's because the early voting favors uh, the Democrat here and the incumbent. But since then, the gap has slowly, slowly narrowed. Mm -hmm. I expect it to narrow even more with the huge turnout in Utah County. Burgess Owens is not out of this race. This race is not over. The gap will continue to close. The question is, is how many people voted on election day and mm -hmm. how many of those go to Burgess? Uh, but this race is not over by any stretch. It's gonna be close one way or the other. And I could see Burgess Owens eking this race out. Okay, let's move on to the state house. We're seeing some very close races. We're gonna pull up uh, some of those results. This is, we knew this was gonna be a close one. Uh, very tight. We are talking a 40 vote difference right now for incumbent Craig Hall over Fatima Deary. Also, some other close races. This is uh, the uh, House District 38. Uh, incumbent Eric Hutchings losing by a large percentage in this one at this time. And in uh, 39, Jim Dunnigan, the uh, incumbent there, he's closing the gap a bit, but still about a 4% difference. And I should also note that in District 45, Representative Steve Elison is losing at the time now. Again, we have canvassing over the next couple of weeks and we have seen these uh, races reverse. So this is still early, but already, Scott, you got to look at uh, Democrats potentially maybe being able to flip some seats in the House. Boy, wouldn't that be exciting to see four new faces up there on Capitol Hill. But I'll tell you, it, it, it's not over till it's over. And depending on how many absentee ballots and how many other uh, the provisional ballots that are going there, it, it, all of them are pretty much uh, still not going to be decided for uh, at least two or three more days. Mm -hmm. uh, a, ma a majority of those races are in that fourth congressional district. So yeah. we have to apply the same logic here. The early votes are going to tend to trend toward the left candidate, the Democrat candidate. And as we get closer to election day votes being counted, the conservative candidates are going to do better. That's the trend here. So as the gap closes in the fourth congressional district, these races that you put up are largely in the fourth congressional district. The gap will continue to close. In one of them, only 30% of the votes have been counted. I think in one, 50% of the votes. There's a long way to go. These are far from over, just like the fourth congressional and district. But there definitely is a trend there. And uh, it's something to watch. And these are ones we watch every every election cycle. A couple of other notable races, Senate District 8, uh, Senator Reby, the incumbent, the Democrat there, huge lead right now. And also House District 32, 
Incumbent Democrat Suzanne Harrison with a big lead there as well. We thought these might be close races, Scott, but uh, at this point they are not. Two great candidates, uh, as I mentioned earlier tonight, and I think those are going to uh, hold, I'll call that for Senator Reby and also for Representative Harrison. Great candidates, and they, they really did a great job of getting out and meeting the people. Uh, I'm, and I'm thrilled to have them up on Capitol Hill. Okay, Thomas, 30 seconds left. Uh, if Democrats are successful in chipping away here, what does that mean to the Republican uh, Party in Salt Lake County? Well, look, I've been the Salt Lake County chairman. I've been the Utah Republican Party chairman. I know this. Salt Lake County is the battleground for Republicans. We cannot take these races for granted. They're uphill battles for us. We have to organize ourselves in those districts and we have to get out the vote. This is a good reminder of that. And it's also a good reminder, Glenn, that these races by and large are really influenced by up ticket races. Mm -hmm. You know, Biden is doing really well in these areas and that's why these candidates are doing well. Yeah. And so up ticket races matter a lot, but so does organization. We can't take anything for okay. granted. We won Salt Lake County in these seats by or out organizing the Democrats. Mm -hmm. Back in 2008 and 2009, we need to remind ourselves about that and start doing it again. Okay, we're going to have to end it on that note. Gentlemen, great insight. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. We'll be right back after the break.